What's cracking, y'all? Welcome back to the station. Welcome back to the channel. Y'all know what it is. Your boy, Ray G. You can find me on X at Ray G. Q. That's Q-U-E. I'm recording this video at about 7 p.m. Sunday night, right before the kickoff of the Bills and the Bengals game. Excited for that one. Still a little down about that loss for my Dallas Cowboys right there. Dak Prescott played awesome, but unfortunately... Eagles got it done. Another loss by Dallas, so I got to endure that for another week down here. But I appreciate y'all tapping in. A little instant reaction. Rookie instant reaction from what happened Saturday night and what we saw this past Sunday in the NFL. And just quick takes on these rookies, in particular the quarterbacks from 2023. And then looking ahead at the 2024 quarterback class that is absolutely loaded coming off a phenomenal week in a college football where we saw a lot of these players really put some good stuff on wax and I was talking back and forth with Jim Nagy the director of the senior bowl last night like man I don't know how you're going to do it this year with having to select six quarterbacks because you look across the college football landscape right now now, there's about eight, nine, ten quarterbacks that are draft eligible. They're playing damn good football. We're going to talk about a couple of those players tonight, as well as some cats in the NFL doing their thing right now from a rookie perspective. So let's just jump right into it. Coming off of the big game, I mean, 52 to 42, and a lot of people talking about uh, Caleb Williams. Caleb Williams, Michael Penix, and you take a look around the NFL right now, you just you look at the quarterback situation in the positions. This past Sunday, we saw Jaron Hall. Josh Dobbs, Clayton Toon getting snaps at quarterback. Brett Ripien in Los Angeles getting reps at quarterback, having to start for an injured Matthew Stafford. We look across the board in the quarterback position right now from top to bottom is just kind of in flux. You look at all the NFL teams, and yeah, some teams are locked and loaded with their starters in the game, and Patrick Mahomes locked and loaded. Justin Herbert, we know he's going to be the long-term answer, but Tyson Bajan taking snaps for the Chicago Bears. You got Taylor Heineke in Atlanta. We know he's not the long-term answer. Neither is Desmond Ritter. Sam Howe looking good. Mac Jones struggling in New England. That whole operation not looking good. And then you got Aiden O'Connell starting and getting a big win for the Las Vegas Raiders as well as Daniel Jones dropping and potentially being out for the season with an ACL injury for New York. So it only makes you think about what's coming in and the potential replacements for some of these fringe level starters. And one of the guys who seemed to be getting a lot of hate coming off of last this past weekend's this past Saturday's loss, USC's quarterback, Caleb Williams. And say what you want about his fingernail polish or his off script plays over the past couple of weeks. People have been very, very silly when it comes to Caleb Williams. Oh, I don't know if he's QB1 or QB2. I, I don't think he's going to be a good pro. I tweeted some stuff out about Caleb Williams and the responses that I got were, I don't think he's going to be able to make it in the NFL. He doesn't look like he can play in the NFL. Too many non-script, off-throw, off-platform throws. Stop with the foolish shit, y'all. Like, just stop overthinking it. I know every single season we get to a point where it's prospect fatigue, it's name fatigue, and we just want to throw new names out there. And this is no slight to Drake May. This is no slight to J.J. McCarthy. Those are phenomenal-looking prospects. This is your QB1. Caleb Williams and what he's doing with this USC team. And as somebody who is a avid USC Trojan supporter, I've been watching this team, followed this team for a long time. It's a lot of Caleb Williams. I know everybody gives Lincoln Riley all this praise, all this credit, but you look at this team and the weapons that he has offensively, it, it's not, he's not loaded like a Michael Penix. He does not have a Roma Dunze. He doesn't have a Dylan Johnson. He doesn't have a Jalen McMillan. No, McMillan wasn't playing. Polk is a nice receiver, but he doesn't have these guys. He's throwing to Taj Washington, who's a nice complimentary piece, but nobody is drafting Taj Washington as a top two, three, four round pick in the NFL draft. Ben, Brennan Rice, we like Brennan Rice. Maybe he can carve out a, a role to be a complimentary wide receiver at the next level. But this, this USC Trojans team thrives and, I mean, I guess they die with Caleb Williams. And this past weekend, throwing for 312, three touchdowns through the air. I thought he was incredible in this game versus Michael Penix. USC fired the damn defensive coordinator, Alex Grinch, which should have been, shouldn't have been retained and brought back this season. But finally, after giving up 52 points versus Washington at home, enough was enough. Losing three games, first time outside the top 25 in the AP poll in the Lincoln-Riley uh, time at USC. Th this is what Caleb Williams has to do, and a lot of people are giving him crap because he's crying with his moms like the kid cares. It's a passion. He's 21 years old, young man, and despite, despite the wins and the losses that USC 
has suffered this year. This does not reflect poorly on Caleb Williams. Is he a perfect prospect? No. And I think a lot of times people talk about him like he has no flaw. I have never once comped him to Patrick Mahomes because I think that's insane to put that on a college a college player right now who we don't know how he's going to matriculate and transition to the NFL. So to compare him to Patrick Mahomes is absolutely banana land. I would never do that. But he is, in my opinion, the best quarterback prospect in this class. Drake May is a nice player. We didn't get to see him do anything this past weekend. You know, I like J.J. McCarthy, and we'll talk about him in a second. But looking at Caleb versus Penix in this game, and this was a very good opportunity to see both of these guys up close and personal, uh, you know, one one against one, head-to-head battle. And Michael Penix, I thought he was impressive too. You see right here, only had eight incomplete passes, did throw an interception in that one. Both of these guys had very similar QBRs. Both of them very similar stat lines for the most part. 256 for Michael Penix, 312 for Caleb Williams. The one thing that really concerns me when I'm watching Michael Penix play is his inability to run. He is not going to do anything. I believe the stat coming into the game where 89% of his passes all come from inside the pocket. Only 11% of his pass attempts this season have come outside of the pocket, which you can read that one or two ways. You could read that and say, that's incredible. He's got great pocket awareness. He stands in the pocket. But I also want to see you be able to do something when you're forced to move outside the pocket. And you can tell, despite a very nice touchdown pass he threw to Polk in that game, when Michael Penix is running around and outside of the pocket, that's not where he lives. It's not where he thrives. It's not where he's comfortable. That's not where he wants to play. Whereas you look at Caleb Williams, and he has no problem doing some of those things outside the pocket, off out of structure, off script plays. He's going to. He's going to. He's going to have some transitional things that he has to deal with. You can't run around for 15 seconds in the NFL. We get that. But some of the magic, some of the intangibles, the arm strength, the confidence, the ability to escape and extend plays, they're phenomenal. Caleb Williams is the quarterback one. Don't get silly, folks. I understand USC is three losses. I don't care. I don't care how many losses USC has. This is the best quarterback in the country. He is the number one quarterback prospect and should be drafted as 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 such come 2024. Michael Penix, I'm still struggling with him, y'all. You know, I'm watching him, and I'm trying to tell myself the story that he's to a tongue of Aloha, that he can be that type of processor and passer at the next level. And it just, I walk away every week wanting to love Michael Penix, wanting to be all in on Michael Penix. And a lot of the times I just walk away thinking he's okay. You know, he's a, he's a, he's a damn good college quarterback. Like, I don't want to just, he's okay as far as his, his next level perspectives. I think he's okay. Day two pick for Michael Penix. I don't believe he's going to be a first-round pick. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I'll admit that. But right now, I don't think he's a first-round caliber type quarterback in this 2024 class. I, think, I believe there are three quarterbacks. It's Drake May, Caleb Williams, and then J.J. McCarthy. And let's let's talk about J.J. McCarthy a little bit. Michigan put an absolute beat down on Purdue this weekend. It wasn't a close game. And it, it wasn't even like J.J. McCarthy went out there and threw five, six touchdown passes. He didn't have any. No touchdown passes, but 24 for 37, 335, average 9.1 in attempt, QBR 73, didn't run at all, which is surprising. I mean, took a bunch of sacks, negative 31 rushing yards, but I walked away from this game, despite the fact that he didn't have any touchdown passes, saying, like, that's an NFL quarterback. That is a That type of quarterback is the player that you spend a first-round pick on, not the Kenny Pickett's of the world, not the Michael Penix's. It's the talent that J.J. McCarthy possesses. It's his growth, his maturation over the past couple of years. He looks like a completely different player for Michigan. And despite the fact that he had negative 31 rushing yards, do not get it twisted. There are a lot of casual fans out there that come draft season, come NFL Combine, if he declares, once he tests and runs and jumps and does all that pre-Combine, pre-NFL draft type stuff, people are going to be like, wow, he's sneaky athletic. Hell no, he's flat out athletic, and I know the rushing yards aren't indicative of that, but trust me, he is a athlete. He can run, he's got the arm strength to make all the plays, and more importantly, he has progressed as a decision maker in that offense. Very excited for J.J. McCarthy. So as it stands today on November 5th, and I highly doubt this is going to change much, if at all, Caleb Williams QB1, Drake May QB2, J.J. McCarthy locked and loaded at QB3. For me, 
The conversation starts QB4, QB5. Who are those guys going to be? We talked a little bit about Michael Penix. Well, let's pivot to the most experienced guy, one of the most experienced in college football, Bo Nix, who had another monster performance versus Cal. 63-19 to 19 victory over Cal. Jay Knott, a nice running back. I like me some Jay Knott. But you just look at Nix and the experience that he has playing the quarterback position, and I just wonder how much NFL teams covet said experience, a player that's that's seen a lot of ball, played in both the SEC and the Pac-12 now, outdoing some some big time quarterbacks going having to go head to head against Michael Penix. He's got a date with USC and Caleb Williams. Like these this type of environments and these games, I wonder how NFL teams are going to view just him being under center, him seeing different types of defenses. A lot of people think Bo Nix can be a first-round pick, and I think there is a chance with a strong pre-draft process, strong senior bowl, strong combine, strong pro day, he could sneak into there. There are so many teams that are starved at the quarterback position, and we'll get to that in a second, that makes players like a Bo Nix very attractive, as well as LSU quarterback Jaden Daniels. And while he is not a first-round caliber quarterback, we're not, at least I don't believe he's a first-round pick at this moment I know my guy Damian Parson from the draft network had him in his latest mock going number 20 overall to the Atlanta Falcons but this was a matchup I was very much looking forward to because I believe that this was his quote-unquote Heisman moment his opportunity to put the NFL on notice and I thought he did just that he was incredible in this game before he was knocked out nasty nasty hit right to the head neck area came down on him believe it was Dallas Turner knocked him out concussion for the game scary hit but Daniels 219 yards through the air two touchdowns one interception QBR of 97.6 he also gave you a buck 63 on the ground and what he's doing right now statistically is on par with Joe Burrow and what Joe Burrow was able to do in that magical 2019 season where they set NCAA records Jaden Daniels is doing that with not a tenth of the talent of that LSU team. There's no Clyde edwards helaire There's no Justin Jefferson. He does have his version of Jamar Chase on the roster, but he doesn't even have Thad Moss. I like Mason Taylor, but that 2019 LSU team was absolutely loaded offensively from top to bottom. And what Daniels has been able to do since transferring from Arizona State has been nothing short of of remarkable. You look at what he's done this season. I mean, first in the country in QBR. This is a player who's got, he's going to finish the year with over 3,000 passing yards, and he's pushing to have over 1,000 rushing yards on the season for Jaden Daniels. It's, it's, it's absolutely insane what he has been able to do this year. And when I look at him at six foot four, they got him listed at 210. Looks like he can put on a little weight, right? If he's 210, they can bulk him up. They can bulk him up, get him about 215, 220. I mean, this is the type of cat that I believe is a second-round type of pick, and I'm not going to compare him to Jalen Hurts. I'm not going to do that at all. But can he have sort of that same career arc path to where he's drafted early in day two, early second round, he's behind an incumbent starter, and it's a matter of if, not when, or when, not if he gets an opportunity to play. And while we look at that and we hear that hear that second round capital and think from a fantasy perspective, oh, that can't be any good. I mean, take a look at what we had happen on Thursday night with Will Levis. This was a player that a lot of people thought was potentially a first round pick in the NFL draft. He falls to pick number 33, falls to the second round, falls outside the top 15, and everybody hates Will Levis. And he comes in and in two games and on a short week versus the Pittsburgh Steelers, Will Levis went out there 22 for 39, 262. The last interception, I don't even really care. It was at the end of the game, no time left. He's trying to make a play, throws it in the middle of the field, in the end zone, and it's picked off. But back-to-back weeks, I mean, he outplayed Kenny Pickett. There's no doubt about it. There was one at least first-round-looking quarterback on the field on Thursday night, and it wasn't the guy that was drafted in round one. It was Will Levis, the arm talent, the the toughness, some of the decision-making, the ball placement. It just it makes you think when you're watching – Will Levis play ball this year when you're when we see CJ Stroud go out there and set records 470 passing yards five touchdowns versus the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and I don't give a damn who they lost in game this is a rookie quarterback on the Houston Texans throwing the ball Nico Collins Tank Dell a rookie Dalton Schultz nobody really likes Dalton Schultz but Dalton Schultz is a nice tight end 
This is a Tampa Bay team that is a couple of years removed from a Super Bowl with Todd Bowles as your defensive and coordinator, defensive mind, head coach, to go out there and get absolutely eviscerated by this rookie quarterback. And it wasn't like C.J. Stroud just had all day to throw. I mean, he was under duress. He took a couple of nasty sacks. They were on him early. I mean, it felt like Barrett and Devin White just lived in the backfield. And to watch him do that, it really just makes you think, looking ahead, like which one of these quarterbacks can mirror or have that same type of impact at the next level? You're talking about Will Levis, right? People excited about him. C.J. Stroud, the best rookie quarterback so far in 2023. We saw Anthony Richardson get on the field and get to play early. And now we're watching Bryce Young struggle with the Carolina Panthers. And we looked at that situation early thinking that was going to be a situation with Frank Wright, a situation where it's going to be a great environment for this young rookie quarterback to develop. And it seems like it's it's completely the opposite. I would want everybody in Houston and nobody in Carolina because it doesn't look like right now they have a clue what the hell they're doing in Carolina. And it just feels like, you know, what they're going to end up doing is screwing up Bryce Young in the long run. So let's just go to that Houston game and talk some rookie takeaways. C.J. Stroud, again, incredible. 30 for 42, 470 yards, five touchdowns. And look at the passing down the field, past 20, the 20 yards. I mean, three touchdowns, three for five. 132 yards down the left, left, left and deep, right? Left side of the field, beyond 20 yards. Two for two down the middle of the field, beyond 20 yards. And then one for one, right side of the field, right hash, beyond 20 yards. Short and intermediate was incredible. I mean, he was spectacular in this matchup. And that was still with him getting touched up by this Tampa Bay defense. There were a lot of people who were nervous about C.J. Stroud. I don't know, not a lot of mobility. This Ohio State offense It never works out. We can dead that now. Maybe those other quarterbacks, the Troy Smiths of the world, some of the other players from Ohio State that were drafted that has not worked out, maybe that was just part of them, the Cardell Joneses of the world. But C.J. Stroud's a different cat. He's shown us that he has an ability. He said it from the beginning. I am a ball placement specialist, and he's doing that right now. And moving forward, he's going to be the type of quarterback. You throw for 470, you got Tank Dell involved, you got Noah Brown looking like a stud. Other players are going to want to come play with C.J. Stroud. So we are all collectively excited about what he can do moving forward and trying to make sure that we can find some some similar parallels and takeaways for some of these collegiate athletes moving forward. And not every time, but if you're accurate in college, if that's your claim to fame and you've got the tools and the traits to back that accuracy up, you can't just be accurate with mediocre arm strength, no kind of mobility, a a below average athlete. You have to have some of the physical tools that can help you succeed at the next level, drive the ball in the tight windows. CJ Stroud has that. And when you're looking at the collegiate level, does Daniels have some of that to his game? We know he's accurate. Does he have the arm strength? Does he have that, that athleticism? I believe the answers to those questions are yes and yes for this young man. So it's going to be interesting to see this race for You know, the top five quarterbacks in this class, I do believe that the three are pretty much solidified, in my opinion, with Williams, May, and J.J. McCarthy. But rolling into that four or five and hell, even six spot, you've got Jaden Daniels. You have potentially, I'm not as big of a fan of Quinn Ewers, but he didn't and he hasn't played in the past couple of weeks. It's been Malik Murphy, but you still have Quinn Ewers hovering, hovering around there to be a potential top pick in the NFL draft. We talked about Bo Nix, Michael Penix. One that I do not think is going to declare, and we can just stop. We can stop for this season. He's not going to declare. It's not happening. Colorado quarterback Shadur Sanders. Shadur in this game versus Oregon State. While the final stats don't look bad, 24 for 39, 245, two touchdowns, no picks. I mean, when you talk about under duress, this was a painful game to watch. They didn't do a damn thing until about the fourth quarter. I mean, they can't block. They have no offensive line. It's Travis Hunter or bust. They can't run the ball. Look at this. I mean, negative seven yards is the team. Shador, 37, minus 37 yards, multiple sacks. Again, he's not declaring. He's not coming out. He should not come out. I am still very bullish on him in 2025, but it's very evident that they are lacking significant talent up front. They can't do anything. It's drop back, throw the ball, get pressure, get blitz. Shadur is not coming out, so we can stop talking about Shadur Sanders in the 24 class. It would be a very big mistake for him to declare for the NFL draft after this year. Still bullish on the talent. Love what he can do, but it ain't time yet. It's not time 
for Shadur to be coming out. So I don't think we can, I don't think we have to continue to talk about Shadur Sanders potentially matriculating on to the NFL. But let's talk about a running back who, well, okay, Carson Beck. Carson Beck, Jordan Reed, my man from uh, ESPN, formerly of the Draft Network. I've asked him about Carson Beck. He finally talking about started talking about Carson Beck, saying that he's put a lot of good stuff on tape. And I do think so as well. He can return for another season. Carson Beck has got the physical tools. He's six foot four, 220 pounds. Junior, you see what he's done on the season, 27, 16, 4, 82 QBR, top 10 in the country. Carson Beck is a name that people aren't really talking about. And this Georgia team, while they're not as dominant as they've been in the past, they wouldn't be where they are right now just on their defense alone. Don't get it twisted and think that this is just a defensive thing. No, it's Carson Beck making throws week in and week out, getting Lab McConkey and Oscar, Oscar Delp and company the ball to really, to really help that offense and help that team stay afloat. They do have a good defense, but it is not just the Georgia teams of the past where it's all defense, no quarterback. Carson Beck would be interesting. Jackson Dart continues to stack good positive games on top of one another, but I do not believe Jackson Dart is a legitimate NFL caliber quarterback at this time. Feels a lot like a day three type of pick. If he were to declare to the NFL, you know, round four, round five, something like that. And that's not a death sentence either. So I don't want to not killing the kid or anything like that. But I just don't believe that he's a legitimate quarterback prospect in the 23 class. Now, one that I've talked about and I just struggle with going back and forth. Jordan Travis. Jordan Travis playing phenomenal ball. If they continue to play the way they've been playing, even though they struggle with Pittsburgh a lot in this game. But Tra Jordan Travis is playing good football. And he's not getting a lot from anybody outside of Trey Benson and Keon Coleman. Coleman didn't play this game. Uh, what's it? Johnny Wilson injured, so he wasn't in this game. So it was a lot of a lot of Jordan Travis trying to make this thing happen and make this thing shake on his own. I don't know. I don't know. Feels like feels like a fun college player that when you really start thinking about him at the next level and you watch his game. I have a hard time seeing a franchise say that's the type of cat that we want leading this team and we think can lead this team to a Super Bowl. I just, I'm not seeing that out of Jordan Travis. A fine second, day two pick. If you want to say that he's going to be a day two guy, I'm fine with that. But anything further, anything more than that for Jordan Travis, I just have a hard time seeing that one for, for, for him. I like the player. I don't know about, uh, I don't know about high end upside at the NFL. Other than that, you still have Joe Milton trying to do his thing at Tennessee. I'm not in on Joe Milton. He's got all the physical tools in the world. Just not really in on Joe Milton and his perspectives at the next level. But let's pivot back to the NFL for a little bit and move to a different position. And let's talk about wide receiver. And we saw one of the wide receivers who we had rated as the top guy in the 2023 class, Jackson Smith and Jigba, finally get it going this week. There he is right there, fastest ball carrier for the Seahawks, 19 miles an hour for JSM. You look at the receiving, he had six targets, caught six, seven targets, caught six of those passes, 463 yards, and outdueled Zay Flowers, who didn't do much of anything at all in this game. I believe Zay Flowers had one reception for a couple of yards in this game. They didn't really need to throw the ball a ton. Seattle was awful. They got beat down. They pulled their starters. The, the Ravens pulled their starters Hell, going into the fourth quarter, so there wasn't much Lamar and company needed to do. Geno Smith was not good, but Jackson Smith and Jigba starting to turn it on a little bit at, of late. And when you think about these rookie receivers in this class, two guys head-to-head, -head, Flowers and JSN in this matchup, you got Puka Nakua, Jordan Addison doing his damn thing, balling out, at least from the high-end high end caliber weapons. And we got a big opportunity again for Quentin Johnston on Monday night versus the Jets. Absent, you know, we know Josh Palmer is out. I believe there's another player, another receiver out for the Chargers. So now it's step up time. Let's go. It's your time, Quentin Johnson, to step it up. But just thinking ahead to my favorite position to scout, my favorite position to talk about, maybe it's because I play defensive back. I just like talking receivers, trying to figure out the wide receiver position. And when we look at the rookie receivers that have come in and made an impact, a lot of these guys have similar similar traits, similar things, right? Their ability to win quickly off the line of scrimmage. Jay Flowers, you see it when you watch him. His ability to boom, boom, that quick twitch stuff, 
get off the line of scrimmage, make defenders miss, the lateral agility. When you're talking about Jackson Smith and Jigba, you say what you want about the 40, the three cone, his ability to start, stop, shiftiness is what makes him special. Jordan Addison. Puka Naku is just a savvy guy. He's a savvy route runner. He's playing in an offense that wants to throw the ball. But we're seeing those type of weapons make an impact at the NFL level. And when you look at the 2024 class, my goodness, the the apple of this class's eye is the wide receiver position. And I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about them, but I also don't want to just gloss over Marvin Harrison Jr. And he did not have a big game this weekend, caught two touchdowns, but you just look at what he's done this season on a team. I don't care if Ohio State's number one in the college football playoff rankings. This is this is not they don't look like a number one team, but you look at Marvin, what he's done. He's on his route to another thousand yard season. So you're gonna have back to back thousand yard seasons for this six foot three, six foot four, two hundred and ten freaking monster Marvin Harrison Jr. He is, will be, has been, don't debate it. He is the unquestioned wide receiver one in the 2024 class. Period. Move on to the next because we all know it's going to be Marvin Harrison Jr. And there's a lot of talk about who in fact is wide receiver two of this class. And for me, it has been, it will be, and it is LSU wide receiver Malik Neighbors, who is just playing out of his mind right now. Malik Neighbors, and if you didn't watch the LSU game, I, I highly suggest you do that because he he was incredible. Malik Neighbors, absolutely incredible again. 10 for 171 and one uncoverable. And this was a game where I wanted to see him against Kool-Aid McKinstry. I wanted to see him against those Alabama defensive backs, and he did not disappoint. They couldn't do anything with him. Right now, Malik Neighbors, I believe, leads the country in receiving yards. 11.52, he's got 10 touchdowns. He's on pace to break LSU's single-season receiving yard mark. Set by you-know-who, Mr. Jamar Chase Uno, the guy that's playing on Sunday Night Football right now. And he has an outside shot to end up as the, the all-time leading receiver at LSU. Leave 3,001 yards is that, and he's got to average like 146 over the na- next couple of games in order to have a chance to truly to truly set that mark. But this is a player, I, I, I have yet to think of a comp for Malik Neighbors, and I heard my man Jordan Reed, he tweeted this out on Saturday night, said he reminds him of DJ Moore. And when I heard that, I'm like, oh shit, that's it. Six foot, 200 pounds, Reminds him of DJ Moore. His yards after the catch is incredible. His air yard attempts. You know I'm talking Trinity here, right? Target share, air yard share, yards after the catch per reception. This is a player who's all the makings of a top 15 pick, if not higher. Look at some of the teams that are going to be picking inside the top 10. Giants, depending on what happens with Daniel Jones and the outcome of that knee, they may be in need of a wide receiver. And if they can't get a Marvin Harrison Jr., maybe Malik Neighbors, Keon Coleman is in their cards. This is just a... This is a very talented receiver. When I think about all the dope receivers LSU has had over the years, and I'm just off my head, y'all. Brandon LaFell, I'm going back, right? Brandon LaFell, Dwayne Bowe, remember old Skylar Green? He was a fun player at LSU. And then you get to some of the more recent names, like a Jarvis Landry and Odell Beckham Jr. Then you've got, of course, Jamar Chase, Justin Jefferson coming out of LSU. Terrace Marshall, not so much. But this was a cat that a couple of years ago, I was like, this is the guy. Malik Neighbors, he's got that you-know-what, that D-A-W-G, that dog in him. But he's a fantastic player. The routes are there, his body control, the catch that he made on the sideline before scoring the touchdown where he literally contorted his foot mid-air to tap it and keep it in bounds. This is all the makings of a top 15 pick. It is Marvin Harrison Jr. And no, I do not believe as good as Malik Neighbors is, he will challenge Marv. For wide receiver one, listen, you want to say it's Keon Coleman. You want to say it's Romo Dunze. You want to say it's Xavier Worthy. I hope you're not doing that. Troy Franklin, there are a lot of talented pass catchers in this class. But in my opinion, this is the best one. His speed, his transition, the fluidity, the way he sinks his hips and his routes. This is going to be a fun player. Very excited to watch the growth and maturation throughout the pre-draft process for Malik Neighbors and thinking about him at the next level. That's what I want. I don't just want a Quentin Johnston type where it feels like he's one-dimensional. I don't just want a yak guy like Rondell Moore was coming out of uh, Purdue a couple of years ago. I want a well-rounded receiver that's done it against elite-level competition, and that's what they're having to do at LSU. And 
the interesting thing about this team opposed to the Jamar Chase and the Joe Burrow since the, the Joe Burrow LSU team is everybody knows like it's neighbors. Brian Thomas is a very good player as well, but stop him, shut him down. They can't run the ball, stop Jay, and they can't do it. And he continues to go out there week after week and just put up monster performances. Very excited about Malik Neighbors. This is a player that I hope to get a lot of shares of in rookie drafts in 2024. Now let's talk running back a little bit. Let's just let's just let's just vibe with the running back class. It ain't good. And I know you can look at Trey Benson. I liked him too coming into the season. He had 90 something yards, nice little touchdown run. And I'm just seeing I'm seeing a complimentary running back. A guy that if he starts, I don't know. I just I don't know. I'm very, very apprehensive to be all in on Trey Benson. I like Blake Horm. It kind of feels like by de facto, by default, he's the best running back in the class. But Michigan, they got five damn offensive linemen that are going to all be at the senior bowl. They're all getting drafted. I mean, it's it's tough to just buy into one. The one that's kind of stuck around and hung around all year and finally had a big game was uh, Ohio State running back Travion Henderson. It's about damn time he's done something. And my thing with Hendo is big Hendo can play. 22, 128, one touchdown. He can catch the ball. He gave you five for 80. I mean, he can do everything. But damn, I need you on the field. Like, I, I, I need him consistently on the field. He's got 90 carries this year. Last year, didn't do much of anything, right? Injured and banged up. Had 107 carries in 2022. Freshman season, this is why we got so excited. I mean, 1,200 yards on sub-200 attempts. And then he gave us 300 yards and four touchdowns through the air. This was the one-on-one. This was supposed to be the unquestioned RB1 top 20 pick in the NFL draft. He's going to be one of the few running backs drafted in round one. But the fact that he has not been healthy, his inability to stay on the field is very scary. There's no doubt. When Travion Anderson is on the field and playing, man, there ain't, no, there ain't many people more dynamic than him in the NFL, but you, your best ability has to be your availability. And until he can consistently do that, it's hard for me to elevate him to a spot to where I'm just like, yeah, this is the guy, no doubt about it. Give, give me Travion Henderson. Jonathan Brooks out of Texas, I like him. Brooks is like, I like him. I'm not going to say he's the best running back in the class, but this, I, I believe this. I'll say this. I think that Jonathan Brooks is better than the idea of what we have for Roshan Johnson. And in fantasy, a lot of people start to pump and steam up Roshan Johnson. This year, I believe that Jonathan Brooks is a better player than Roshan Johnson. And right now, he is a top five running back in this class to me and closer to number one than he is to number five in this class. And I'll say that again. He ain't one, but he's closer to RB1 for me in this class than he is RB5. And that's that's a testament to Jonathan Brooks, but it's also an indictment on the class because the class itself just is not that good. And I know a lot of people, oh, Ray, well, talk to me about, uh, what's his name, uh, the big boy out of Wisconsin. Let's let's talk about him, Braylon Allen. And everybody's, you know, the people's champ, the people's RB1, Braylon Allen. So let's just, let's just talk through Braylon Allen, what he's done, and, and just the thoughts about him moving forward uh, in for the NFL. And no, no, he didn't play this week, but let's just find old Braylon and look at their team. Let's just look at what they've done on the season and what Braylon Allen has done in particular. Here we go. Braylon Allen on the season. And this is what's concerning to me is he's losing them carries. They want to give the ball to Chesma Lose. They want to give the ball to all these other players. And you got Braylon Allen right here. Now, look at this, though. Braylon Allen catching the ball this year, which he's never done. More receptions this season than he's had his entire year, his his entire career, averaging 5.8 an attempt. But again, it's the consistency, right? The consistency for Braylon Allen week to week. One week, he's got a big game. He handles 29 carries. Next game, they don't want to give him much of anything. And I don't understand. I thought this coaching scheme was supposed to help Braylon out, Braylon Allen out a lot this season. And everything that I've been hearing is it's kind of doing him a disservice this year of how they do things, right? Why the hell do you only have seven carries versus Washington State when they lost the game and it wasn't like they been bl- they were blown out. So when I'm looking at Allen, he's not Derrick Henry. He is not Derrick Henry. Even though he's 6'2", 245, he's not Derrick Henry. So get that idea out of your head. He's not Derrick Henry. He is still a top five back in the class again kind of by default because there aren't 
the glass is just a little lukewarm. And I've been asking people about one of another exciting player, Bucky Brooks, a uh, Bucky Irving, Bucky Brooks, thinking Jonathan Brooks, Bucky Irving from Oregon, and asked a couple of people I know. Brentley Wiseman from the Draft Network follows the Oregon Ducks quite closely, and I just asked him, man. I know they got him listed at. 5'10", 190 something on the website, but how big is Bucky? Like, how big is he really? He's probably like 5'10", a buck 80 times. I got him listed at 5'10", 195. I like Bucky Irving. I'll say that again. I like Bucky Irving a lot. And a lot of people I've seen try to compare him to Devon H. And he's not Devon H. And he does not have that type of speed. But the body control, his ability to run between the tackles and catch the ball out of the backfield, I've seen a couple of people say Alvin Kamara light is sort of the play style comp for Bucky Irving. I don't hate it. He's not Alvin Kamara because Kamara is what? A solid 215 pounds. It's a lot bigger than people give him credit for. But Bucky Irving does have incredible contact balance. I know our data guy, Jordan Backus, likes him a lot. And he's been consistent every single game. I mean, he's going to give you three to five catches every single week. He's going to handle, you know, 12, 13, 14 plus attempts every single week. So that type of ability to be used in the backfield and in space is very exciting. Unlike what's happening in damn Atlanta with Arthur Smith and Bijan Robinson. I, I mean, listen, I didn't think we should be drafting any running back number one overall in super flex. Like I, I wouldn't take a mo. I would not have done that and still don't believe that you should draft running backs early in rookie drafts or at least over quarterbacks in Super flex formats. Yeah, I do not believe that is a winning strategy long term. But damn, Arthur Smith, I I don't I don't know what Bijan did to Arthur Smith, man. I, I have no clue what he did to Arthur Smith. Bijan Robinson did fumble today, but man, you talk about for for what we expected to get from this player when we came into the season. Some people drafting him as the number one overall running back. You're very disappointed. You're very disappointed, and. It's almost to the point where you could say he's been at ADP and at cost. He's been a bust. And I don't believe that is because B. John Robinson is bad at football. He's just with a boneheaded coach that says, you know what? I don't give a damn. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue to jam Tyler Algier up there. He had a touchdown today. B. John fumbled. And once that happened, we all knew. We all knew at that moment, well, that's it. B. John's not going to touch the ball anymore. Fumbled. That's it. Not touching the ball. It's just... Very frustrating to watch what's happening to this young running back. And that is the key point, y'all. A young running back, not a receiver. We're talking about a position where every game is like just chopping off time in that dynasty lifespan. So this season, if he's not returning that top five value that we wanted, like what is he going into next year? How are people going to value B. John Robinson, this asset that you thought you can trade for anything, the safest, most secure asset in fantasy football, and it feels like the way that Arthur Smith and this team is trending, you're just not going to be able to realize the full potential of him. And the problem is they've won too many games and probably will continue to win a few that they're not going to be in range to draft a legitimate game-changing quarterback, which means what do they do? Everybody's talking about, oh, trade for Justin Fields. Go, I doubt that's going to happen. Trade for Kyler Murray. I doubt that's going to happen. Something has to shake. Something. That, we're nine weeks into the season, and we're still waiting on the game. I had him ranked as the top five running back on the week in my weekly rankings because I said, this is the week. New quarterback going up against Jaron Hall. No Justin Jefferson. The Vikings are banged up. This is a Bijan game. Not getting it. Not getting it from this rookie running back. And I, I'm very curious what dynasty managers would do who are thinking about this season. I'm going to ask you this question, YouTube. I'm going to pose the question to you. Tell me in the chat. This season, you're trying to compete. You're trying to win. Devon A. Chan is cleared to return. He's coming back off of IR. Who do you want the rest of the way? B. John Robinson or Miami Dolphins running back Devon A. Chan? Talk to me. I truly want to know the answer to this question. Now, we go through the NFL. Are there any other hot rookies that we want to talk about? Luke Musgrave had a decent game today. I think he had three for 50 in the receiving game. I and mean, it's just Jordan Love. He's not, he's not the worst quarterback, but damn, man, he ain't the best quarterback either. Jordan, Luke Musgrave, 
had uh, three catches, 51 yards, and a touchdown. There goes Luke Musgrave right there. Ontavian Wicks got in the action too, dropped one ball. I mean, dropped one pass that ended up resulting in a fumble. We talked about Puka Nakua earlier. That target share is still there. Brett Rippian, though. That target share is there, but Brett Rippian is at quarterback, so that is not going to be good for anybody involved. We go to the Chicago game. We talked a little bit about Tyson Bajan. He had four turnovers in this game, so we can stop with the him over Justin Fields. Roshan Johnson, nothing. Giving us absolutely nothing. Kendra Miller hurt again today, so there goes that. And on the New Orleans pass catchers, there's nobody else to talk about, right? Well, Tyler Scott from uh, Chicago, nothing there. Uh, nothing from New Orleans. There's no rookie out there to talk about at all. Carolina versus Andy Bryce Young, awful, just bad. 20, 24 for 39, 173, three picks, two of them pick sixes, awful, just terrible, just looks bad. Don't see the situation changing anytime soon. Love Bryce Young. The Carolina made a bad choice. I mean, it, it feels like they wanted C.J. Stroud. That's the type of quarterback you wanted, so then you go get a guy who is limited, and then you have a non-creative offense, and you think that he's going to thrive. It's just a terrible, terrible situation in Carolina, and it seems like Frank Wright was either not the right hire or a combination of a little bit of both between Frank Wright not being the proper hire and then Bryce Young maybe not being that guy that we thought he could be when he was drafted by the Carolina Panthers number one overall. So Buffalo and Cincinnati playing right now. Let's see what's happened so far. What's happened in the game? Allen. Uh, Allen got a rushing touchdown. Mixon doing his thing, and Joe Burrow threw one. Who'd he get the ball to? Who'd he throw it to? I'm going to take a guess here. Look at that. Irv freaking Smith. Uh, and they said he wasn't going to be doing anything in this one. And there goes Irv Smith with the touchdown. Yossi Voss right there getting a catch. Nothing so far from our boy Jamar Chase. So, again, looking at the college landscape and thinking of some of the quarterbacks coming in, I know a lot of people were excited about Cam Ward. We can stop with that one. Like, no thank you to Cam Ward from an NFL talent perspective. Like him for college. Anything beyond that, no thank you on Cam Ward. I uh, just wanted to touch on the quarterbacks tonight, especially looking across the NFL landscape. And let's just play this game right here. Who is safe at quarterback? This game that's going on right now, Allen and Burrow, locked and loaded. We don't have to worry about those two. No QB changes there. Chargers and the Jets, well, we know. Justin Herbert locked into place. And Aaron Rodgers for a year, but I think the Jets could be in the market for a quarterback. We know it's not Zach Wilson. Tennessee... Will Levis, I believe, should be their starting quarterback at least for next season. Give him a full year, see what you have in him. You spent the second round pick. Rock with Will Levis for a year, see what you have. Kenny Pickett, definitely think the Steelers could be in the market for another quarterback. Miami and Kansas City, that situation is secure. No new quarterbacks coming into those teams. Here you go. Minnesota with Kirk Cousins on the IR with an Achilles tear. Taylor Heineke and Desmond Ritter, both of these teams should be in the market for a quarterback in 2024. Baltimore locked up with Lamar Jackson. Geno Smith, not so safe in my opinion. He is not so safe, and he has not been playing good football this year at all. Kind of turning back into the old Geno Smith of the past. Still, he's signed. He's in place. I don't believe there's a rookie that's going to get drafted to take his place, but Geno Smith has already come out to say that he would be all supportive if the Seahawks were to bring in a quarterback to be a mentor. So I do believe Seattle could potentially be in the market for a quarterback in 24. Browns are going to be locked in place with Deshaun Watson at least for the next couple of years. Arizona should retain Kyler Murray. Don't even think about trading him, so they should be solid and safe. Rams and the Packers, I believe both teams could be in the market for a quarterback. Are they going to be drafting high enough to get one of the elite guys that matter? Maybe the Rams if they continue to lose. Maybe, depending on Matt Stafford, if they got to keep rolling out Brett Rippey and they will be in, in play for a quarterback early enough. And the Packers, it feels like Jordan Love can go either way. He feels kind of like Kenny Pickett, like he's good enough to maybe get by, but you know you're probably not winning with Jordan Love. I'll say both of those teams could be in the market for a quarterback, but less likely that Green Bay goes that route. In my opinion right now, that can change. Houston, we know they are locked and loaded at quarterback. I want to say Tampa Bay is locked, but Baker Mayfield is not the problem. Baker Mayfield is not the problem in Tampa Bay. So maybe he's earning himself another season under center for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Same with Mac and Sam Howe. And the, the thing is, I don't know if Mac Jones is going to be the New England Patriots starting quarterback long-term, but that pick wasn't on him. And everybody's saying he shouldn't have thrown the ball, stop it. Because if he completes the pass, what a great throw, tight, tight window. It wasn't even like it was an awful pass. Juju Smith-Schuster dropped a damn ball. Like, be real. It ain't even about defending Mac, hating Mac. 
the ball was in his hands and he dropped it. It wasn't like a look. He, and then he dro- throws a dime to Jalen Rager. That's dropped. That changes the math of the field, changes the game. He's going to start somewhere. I'll tell you that. He's going to start somewhere. And I do believe the Washington Commanders at least have found their quarterback of the immediate future in Sam Howe. These two teams, I believe Chicago and New Orleans, could both be in the market for a quarterback in 2024. Indianapolis, they've got their guy in Anthony Richardson. Bryce Young is interesting. They traded the farm for him. So they got to roll with him. But I wonder, I just wonder, if the organization sides more with Frank Wright, could this be a situation where it gets Josh Rosen, where one year and, and he gets traded off somewhere? Highly doubt that's going to happen, but it just doesn't feel like this is a very good fit for the Carolina Panthers. Giants, especially if Daniel Daniel Jones is hurt, they will be in the market for a quarterback, and they will be drafting high enough to get one, and the Raiders as well. I mean, Aiden O'Connell, fine backup, but they should be in the market for a quarterback, and you got Dallas and Philadelphia, both of those teams secure at the quarterback position. So again, when we're thinking about 2024 and we're thinking about the potential rookie quarterbacks that could be matriculating onto the NFL— A very good time to be in the market for a quarterback if you're an NFL franchise. Very good time to be a good quarterback in college because the thirst for signal callers in the NFL is real. So there it is. Not a lot of data. Just quick reactions coming off of week nine of the NFL season and week 10 of the college football season. We're winding up. Winding down that fantasy season. We're getting close to prospect time. And y'all know that's what I love more than anything in the world, talking about collegiate players and how they could fit as puzzle pieces on their respective NFL teams. So make sure you're dialed in and tapped in because all of that stuff is coming your way very soon. I appreciate everybody sticking around watching this. How long did I go? I don't even know. Almost 50 minutes, 50 minutes show, 45 minutes on this, man. Hit the thumbs up button, like the content, subscribe to the channel. Make sure y'all wake up with myself and Jay Rich tomorrow as we deep dive the top takeaways from week nine of the fantasy season, look ahead to the Monday night game, and start to think about what we're going to do in week 10. I appreciate y'all being here. Y'all enjoy the rest of the Sunday night game, and I'll see y'all bright and early tomorrow morning. I'm out. Peace.